I can't believe how quickly OLED monitors are being developed in the gaming monitor space. Today we're looking at the MSI MPG 271 QRX, which sports a flat 27 inch glossy QD OLED panel that runs a refresh rate of up to 360 hertz and a resolution of 1440p. Better still, it has those fabled HDMI 2.1 ports, display HDR True Black 400 certification, and also adaptive sync technologies. Indeed, it is actually quite an interesting proposition. Now the time of filming, and in the UK, it can be found for roughly £900, while in the US, it fluctuates between $900 to $1,000. So in this review, you can see if it's actually worth its price tag and how it compares to some other monitors out there on the market. So jumping straight in, let's talk about its input lag. And here I had it objectively tested at just one millisecond. Indeed, it does a stonkingly good job. And while the graph might throw you off a little bit, do bear in mind that the range is from 0 to 1.1 milliseconds. Indeed, all the recent monitors that I've tested do an excellent job. And therefore means that when I was playing a hardcore competitive game such as Counter-Strike 2 or Valorant, I felt that my mouse inputs were actually being registered instantaneously. I had no issues whatsoever. Now of course, input lag is only one side of the story, but what about when it comes to its response time? Well here, I can safely say that it has got class leading figures. Thanks to the fact that it has a QD OLED panel, I had it tested using the OSRTD tool with an average initial time of just 0.81 milliseconds. That translates to the average D to G that a lot of manufacturers claim. Yes, indeed, it hits 100% of the refresh rate window, and as such means that you're going to get a fantastic experience even at the maximum refresh rate of 360 hertz. Similarly, motion clarity is absolutely excellent, specifically at its highest refresh rate of 360 hertz. Indeed, as you'll be able to see over here via the UFO ghosting test. Now it's worth pointing out and re-emphasizing that given it's an OLED panel, it doesn't suffer from any sort of inverse ghosting, be it in terms of the lighter or darker shades. That is usually the sort of purple trailing you get when you look at an object that is panning from left and right, like you'd find on certain LCD panels, in other words, TN, IPS, or VAs. With that said, however, unlike some other monitor technologies out there, this OLED monitor, very much like some other OLEDs that I've reviewed, does not have any sort of motion blur reduction technology. But in some respect, given the overall motion clarity that you are able to attain out of the box, I do think it's somewhat redundant. And as such, will certainly suffice for hardcore competitive gamers alike. On that note, I should have a quick word about its refresh rate. And yes, indeed, it's not going to give you a night and day difference over 240 hertz panels. With that said, the extra bit of fluidity is certainly appreciated, specifically if you play hardcore competitive games on a day-to-day -day basis. This means that you're going to get a lower system latency because you've got a higher refresh rate, and it also means that it reduces tearing. If you're going to be playing more graphically intense games, that high refresh rate of the monitor just gives you extra bit of headroom to play around with. Now this perfectly brings me on to adaptive sync technologies, in other words, AMD FreeSync and NVIDIA G-Sync. Now this monitor does not have a native G-Sync module, and as such, its VR range sits from 48 up to 360 Hz, which is still actually pretty good. Now in my case, I've got an RTX 3080, and when connected over DisplayPort, I was able to run the NVIDIA Pendulum demo. I didn't incur any sort of flickering or black screen issues. However, when I played a game like Destiny 2, I did notice that at certain instances, there is a bit of flickering. It wasn't overly noticeable and I couldn't quite pinpoint as to when it was actually occurring, but I just did notice it and therefore didn't give me a buttery smooth experience at all given times. Nonetheless, I was able to run NVIDIA G-Sync at 1440p at 360Hz while simultaneously having HDR active, and therefore means all these technologies worked in tandem. So this actually leads me on to HDR. And yes, indeed, this monitor has got a phenomenal HDR experience, which isn't the same that could be said about some other 27-inch WOLED monitors, not to be confused with the QD OLED technology that we have on review today. Now, yes, this monitor has got a peak luminance of up to 1,000 nits, and actually recorded 932 nits to be more specific, but you'll probably want to go for the Display HDR True Black 400 mode. This effectively gives you much better black levels, by sacrificing the overall peak luminance of the monitor, and therefore caps you at roughly 430 nits. Nonetheless, when in using this mode, I felt that while playing a game such as Destiny 2, the overall image was absolutely lifelike. I had no issues whatsoever and didn't encounter any sort of blooming effect either, like you'd find on some mini LED technology, specifically IPS or VAs out there. 
Again, the overall HDR experience was absolutely phenomenal. And in this respect, if HDR gaming is something of importance to you, and if you want to combine this with adaptive sync technologies and let alone its refresh rate, then you'll find that this MSI monitor does actually tick all the right boxes. Speaking of which, this monitor has got two HDMI 2.1 ports, which allows you 1440p at 360Hz, giving it good sort of versatility, which might be handy for those people who are running it with a laptop. Furthermore, it is actually very useful for those who have got a modern day console. I would never recommend a high refresh rate monitor for just consoles only, but if you're going to be running a PC and a console, then it will be handy to know that you'll be able to run 1440p at 120Hz while also using VRR technologies, in other words, adaptive sync, because you have got AMD FreeSync on the Xbox and the PlayStation. Now I was also able to put it through its paces and using the OSRTD tool at 120 hertz, I clocked in an average initial time of just 0.73 milliseconds. Just as a reminder, this is the average G2G which is often quoted by manufacturers and yes, it's stonkingly good. The same could be said at 60 hertz where it was tested at 0.74 milliseconds. As for the overall motion clarity, yet again, it's actually pretty impressive. Yes, again, it does not have the likes of motion blur reduction technologies, but nonetheless, I do think it will certainly suffice even if you are a pretty hardcore gamer on a console. Following on from that, it's great to see that this monitor does actually accept a 4K signal input, which can be handy in certain scenarios, as it effectively takes a 4K signal and downscales it to 1440p. In my case, I have got a 4K Blu-ray player and I was able to run it at 60Hz with HDR enabled. So it's safe to say I'm seriously impressed by its overall gaming performance, but what about when it comes to the image quality? Well, as a reminder, it's got a flat 27-inch glossy QD OLED panel. And yes, indeed, in comparison to the vast majority of monitors out there, it does not have a matte coating to it, which certainly has its advantages when it comes to image quality, but it's worth pointing out that the disadvantages are the fact that it does actually have a lot more reflections. If you have, for example, a bright sunlit room, it might be a little bit harder to view the monitor. Nonetheless, I didn't actually have any sort of problems myself, but just something I thought I should highlight. And the monitor has also got a dedicated sRGB, Adobe RGB and Display P3 modes, which can be selected via the monitor's OSD, all of which are very much appreciated. Now, starting off with the sRGB mode, I had its gamut coverage tested at 98.7% and its gamut volume at 101.6%. Below, you can see how it compares to the sRGB standards. Its average DLT sits at a very low 1.01 and a maximum of 2.26. So yes, this monitor can be used for serious image editing work or video grading. Its test and contrast ratio sat at infinity to one, given it is an OLED panel, and its measured white point was pretty close to the 6,504 Kelvin target at 6,390 Kelvin at 100%. As for its gamma curve, it sits relatively close to the 2.2 standards. Now it's similarly impressive in the Adobe RGB mode. And here you'll be able to see that gamut coverage sits at 95.8% and 104.2%, of course, in comparison to the Adobe RGB standard. And you'll be able to see below how it compares. As for the average Del T and maximum Del T, they sit at a very low 1.16 and 2.67 respectively. So yet again, you can edit if you want in the Adobe RGB space. The test contrast ratio does not change, whilst the measured white point does slightly shift at 6,200 Kelvin at 100%. As for its gamma curve, it's a little bit more off than the 2.2 standard, but it's still pretty much close to what you might expect. Aside from this, it also has a display P3 mode, which would certainly be appreciated for those people running it with a Mac OS system. Here you can see that gamma coverage and gamma volumes have positively been affected, and you can see below how it compares to said color space. As for the average DLT and maximum DLT, they aren't as impressive as the sRGB or Adobe RGB modes, but still are actually pretty low at 1.02 and 3.68. As for its test and contrast year ratio, it yet again does not shift, while its measured white point sits at 6,388 Kelvin at 100%, which is actually pretty close. And the same could be said about its gamma curve, which sits actually a little bit closer to the 2.2 standards. Moving on, we get onto brightness, and here in HDR with the peak 1000 nits mode, I recorded 932 nits. And yes, indeed, it does sit a little bit below the 1000 nits that's claimed by the manufacturer. However, in the true black 400 mode, it sits at 421 nits. Yes, indeed, it's actually still very much bright and will suffice for your overall gaming needs. As for its SDR brightness, given it's an OLED panel, it's no surprise that it actually drops down quite significantly at 257 nits. 
With that said, I actually found it perfectly usable even in a bright sunlit room, running the monitor at roughly 80-90% to 90 brightness. As for its minimum brightness, it goes all the way down to 31 nits, which is actually pretty dim and therefore means that if you're in a completely pitch black room, it will still suffice. On that note over here, it actually brings me on to brightness uniformity, which is absolutely flawless across the board. It's actually quite rare to see this, specifically on a gaming monitor. And in terms of the overall backlight bleed, well, it's non-existent. Given the fact that it has an OLED technology, it means that all the pixels can be switched off and means that you have got a completely pitch black image. So yes indeed it's all very impressive but there are certain limitations of owning an OLED monitor and therefore I thought I should highlight it in this review specifically if you're coming from an LCD, in other words an IPS TN or VA. Now first off you have got that burn in effect but thankfully here the manufacturer has given you a 3 year warranty giving you peace of mind and a bunch of different technologies in other words to mitigate the overall burn in effect. The ID monitors OSD you'll be able to select via pixel shift, panel protect, static screen detection, multi-logo detection, taskbar detection, boundary detection, and you've also got a graphene film with a custom heat sink, which actually tries to dissipate some of the heat. Furthermore, there is also a pixel refresh that will be done every so often, every four hours to be more specific, and will have to be compulsorily done after every 16 hours of cumulative usage. This can be done when you simply switch off your PC and the monitor enters a standby state or of course you can actually perform it yourself where it'll actually take only a few minutes. Now these are all certain things that you should certainly consider because if you're coming from an LCD monitor an OLED will actually require a little bit more of TLC. Now another thing to consider is your fringing effect or in other words the subpixel layout which will be very much of relevance for those people looking at a lot of text like myself who's a journalist. And in this respect, I do actually require a good sort of subpixel layout or indeed optimization. And thankfully, that is the case with this MSI monitor, as the manufacturer claims that they've actually improved it as much as possible due to the fact that it's operating a third generation QD OLED. Here, hopefully, you'll be able to see the images and the differences between this monitor using a QD OLED and comparing it to a W OLED and also a regular IPS monitor. Yes indeed, the LCD monitor will come out on top and doesn't have any of these problems, but in the grander scheme of things and given the other things to consider over here, this monitor actually does do a tremendous job and as such meant that for someone like myself who does look at a lot of text, it didn't actually throw me off on using this monitor on a day-to-day -day basis. So with that out of the way, let's talk about its build quality. And here it's got a three-side borderless design with a relatively thin bottom bezel. It's also got that 27 inch form factor and means that it won't take up too much space on your desk. I also love the fact that the manufacturer has thought about designing the stand in a normal way. In other words, not got a triangular shape or something a little bit awkward, which means it'll fit on more sort of setups. It also has got a very sturdy feel and provides you height, tilt, pivot and swivel adjustments. In fact, the monitor can be rotated both ways. If for some reason you do not want the built-in stand, you can replace it with a Visa compatible stand, allowing you to mount it on a monitor arm or place it on a multi-monitor setup. Now what I don't quite understand however is the inclusion of an RGB strip that's found at the back of the monitor. It doesn't serve a purpose and given it's not bright enough, I just don't think there's any point into it. Therefore you might want to disable it via the monitor's OSD or the software. Speaking of which over here, the OSD can be accessed via a small little joystick button that's found at the center and at the back of the monitor. This gives you a control of the monitor's OSD and is actually very comprehensively laid out. Although I do think that the game mode and the professional mode should be a little bit more bunched up together. It can be a little bit convoluting, specifically if you're going between the different color modes. Nonetheless, once you get your head around it, you'll find that there's plenty of options to play around with. Furthermore, as an extension to this, you've got the MSI Gaming Intelligence software, which can be accessed if you connect over the USB Type-B to Type-A cable. And this effectively gives you the same sort of controls that you'll have via the hardware-based OSD with some extra bit of customization, for example, with the RGB strip. So to conclude, I would just like to talk about its ports. And here you've got a singular DisplayPort 1.4A input, two HDMI 2.1 ports and also a USB Type-C port which also delivers up to 90 watts of power which can be handy if you're connecting up to a laptop. On that note as well, the USB Type-C port can be also handy because the monitor has got a built-in KVM switch effectively allowing you to plug in your peripherals directly into the monitor and also connect up to a PC and a laptop simultaneously without having you to plug in and out your peripherals each time. 
If you want some more information of how KVM operates, make sure you check out my video up on your pop-up banner by following the links down in the description below. Elsewhere, you've also got a headphone output jack, which can be handy for plugging in your headphones directly into the monitor. And this is particularly of importance because the monitor has not got any sort of built-in speakers, which doesn't bother me in the slightest, but just something I thought I should highlight. So with all that in mind, it brings me on to my verdict. And truthfully, I've been left absolutely jaw-dropped by this MSI gaming monitor. Its third generation QD OLED panel really does tick all the right boxes. It's got a very low input lag, fantastic response times, that high refresh rate of 360Hz and good sort of motion clarity. It operates at 1440p and has got that 27 inch form factor, therefore giving you that good sort of blend and also pixel density. You've also got great sort of sub-pixel layout optimizations, meaning that text clarity is going to be actually good. You've also got great sort of color accuracy in the sRGB, Adobe RGB and Display P3 modes, which is quite a rarity, specifically for a gaming monitor. You've also got great sort of brightness uniformity, no backlight bleed due to the fact that it's running an OLED panel, phenomenal HDR experience and support for adaptive sync technologies. Now granted it is an expensive monitor, but if you do look at some other OLEDs out there, it's actually competitively priced. And if you even look at some higher tier LCD panels out there, be it IPS, VA or TN panels, you actually find this is actually quite a good buy. And as a result, it easily gets my best buy award. It's arguably one of the best gaming monitors out there on the market, and it's certainly something that you should consider, at least if you've got the budget. Now I'd be curious to know what you make of the monitor down in the comment section below. If you've enjoyed this detailed independent review, definitely do consider dropping a like, subscribing and hitting that bell notification. All of which would be greatly appreciated. As such, I've been totally dubbed and I hopefully see you next one. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.